Millennium Center. We thank you all for coming today. We are so happy to be celebrating Bruce Stinchcomb Appreciation Day. And uh, <laughs> we got to the band club here. Uh, if you haven't uh, uh, known of uh, his accomplishments, you will before the day is out. So uh, we want to make sure of that. Uh, before we get started, a few little housekeeping things. We've got several events happening here at the museum that we'd like to make you aware of. Uh, we have an architectural ghost tour of downtown St. Genevieve on May the 10th, and two of our local historians are going to talk about some of the homes in the downtown St. Genevieve area that have been lost to history. So uh, that should be very interesting. On May 26th, we have the Antique Car Club. They'll be sitting outside, outside the museum. And if you haven't seen it, we have a loan from Fady Corporation, the 1910 Pullman car, and it's uh, being housed right now at Barley Automotive. Fascinating car. It's in mid condition uh, from 1910, and uh, they um, are uh, showing it for us because uh, we don't quite have the room here in the museum for it, but we will someday soon. Uh, June 3rd, we have a scavenger hunt. That's kind of fun for families. And on June 17th, we have a mystery theater dinner, uh, The Case of the Missing Skull, and you can just imagine it's going to be a dinosaur skull. So uh, if you'd like to uh, take uh, um, uh, tickets for that, they're online, or you can always stop at the uh, museum gift shop. So anyway, just as uh, Bruce has been a great influence on many of you and even outside of this room, hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, Bruce will tell us uh, what was a major influence for him in just a bit. Uh, then we'll have a, a Q&A panel with Bruce and geologist Mike Fix. And um, we'll also uh, be able to answer a lot of your questions if you have uh, some geology and paleontology questions for you. And we also have some refreshments in the back of the room. Uh, feel free to help yourselves. We only ask that you keep your refreshments limited to this room and not um, uh, outside in the, uh, the museum. And please, while you're here today, please tour the museum. Uh, that's what it's here for. We hope uh, you enjoy it. And uh, give us some feedback on, on it. So, so anyway. Uh, given Bruce's bio, I would say an appreciation day is long overdue, and uh, th this will take just a few minutes, but I think it's worth going through. Uh, with more than 50 years of professional experience, Dr. Stinchcomb has been retired since 2005, having worked uh, at St. Louis Community College as a professor of geology since 1969, an associate professor of geology from 68 to 75, and a full professor after 1975. In addition to his geology courses, he taught earth sciences and paleontology. Prior to these roles, he was a teacher of earth science and chemistry at McClure High School uh, from 66 to 68. Earlier in his career, he was a teacher with the Fox C6 School District and a field geologist with the Missouri Geological Survey. He also worked many summers doing geological and mineral exploration for various companies and institutions in remote parts of Wyoming and Montana and northern Canada and Alberta and Alaska. Uh, Dr. Stinchcomb obtained a bachelor's degree in geology in 61 from what is now the Missouri University of Science and Technology. He went on to study at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, receiving his master's in geology in 66 and returned to Missouri University of Science and Tech to earn a PhD in geology in 1978. He was for many years a member of the Paleontology Society and the Geological Society of America. Dr. Stinchcomb was president uh, of the Association of Missouri Geologists and Geology Section Chair, Missouri Academy of Sciences, Senior Division, 2006, and a founding member of the Eastern Missouri Society for Paleontology and a longtime member of the St. Louis Mineral and Gem Society. You got a lot going on there, and that's probably not the half of it. Uh, a very respected voice in the field, Dr. Stinchcomb has published more than a dozen books relating to geology and paleontology. He also was involved with detailed geological mapping in various parts of the Missouri Ozarks, and the list goes on. Uh, we are so proud that Bruce is a member of the museum and the Missouri Ozark Dinosaur Project. Now, Guy Darrell, our curator of the St. Genevieve Museum Learning Center, You've known Bruce probably longer than anyone in this room. And uh, so we, uh, before we hear from Bruce, let's bring you up here and uh, hear from you. I'm just going to give a little bit of an idea how this all happened. Um, I was about 17 or 18. I met Bruce at North St. Louis County at River Road Shopping Mall at a, at a rock show. And I could see that he was talking about all kinds of uh, Missouri fossils, you know, here's a Pachyndosaurus, here's a Sinopia, blah, blah, blah. I'm thinking, I never knew the 
this kind of stuff was in, in Missouri. And then he showed me things uh, that are new to science. And I'm thinking, man, I can learn this stuff. I don't got to go to Australia to make a discovery. I can make it in Missouri. I had started talking to Bruce. Eventually, he showed me his collection. It did something to my brain. And that's all I worked on is fossils. I mean, just for years and years, and it's all I ever did. And <clears throat> I knew eventually that I would have a museum, or at least I thought I did. Or would in, in the lab because you can kind of see what's happening here. At some point, uh, I started going to Bruce on trips and I started learning all kinds of things about geology that I never would have ever had a chance to learn. And uh, actually, uh, he's driving down any road or going anywhere and you'll never get there because it's like every road we have, you know, it's here. <laughs> Eventually, we get there. But anyway, uh, so I learned all about really fossils and, and got my. Uh, start uh, really with, with uh, learning from Bruce. Eventually, um, it got to the point to where, uh, for instance, uh, one day he goes, you know, they just found the world's oldest multicellular forms of life in, in Newfoundland and uh, Cape Race, a little God forsaken area. And uh, he said, I think we ought to go check that out. So we jumped in his uh, station wagon and we went up there. We found hundreds of thousands. They were the oldest things at the time. There were rocks as big as this room just covered with them. So that's why I was going with Bruce because he makes uh, plenty of discoveries. Eventually, uh, he was one of the few people that realized that the dinosaur site was important. Everyone really thought that it was a, maybe a myth. People at the Science Center, for instance, even when I was working there, was telling me, well, those are ice age problems or whatever. I was with them when they were down there doing some test pits. <coughs> backhoe doing some things and eventually uh, I asked Bruce I said can we put in, uh, a greenhouse over the site so we can do some careful systematic uh, uh, excavations and that's when we me and Mike we started doing things very carefully down there and over a number of years and I think we're on our third greenhouse now fortunately the, the uh, tornado didn't destroy it on this last little thing we, we missed it by just thousands of feet really so anyway, um, that's how I got working with Bruce uh, with the dinosaur site, and he's let me, uh, me and Mike, make discovery uh, all this time. Eventually, uh, and I'm getting to where this museum is here. Basically, if it wasn't for me meeting Bruce at North St. Louis at that little gem mineral show, you probably wouldn't have a museum here. Because this is really when I seen his collection, it was like that's it. Yeah, <clears throat> someone said. We want you to go discover a new life form. Uh, we're going to give you a week in Missouri here. And you put all of Missouri's geologists here, and you put uh, Bruce here. If I, I would link up with Bruce, and within a week, we'd have something, probably a couple items. That's the way it works. Down at his areola site, he's working down there. What rolls out? Dinosaur eggs. Give me a break. <laughs> that's, that's his gift. So anyway, that's, that's basically the story. Uh, if you've got any questions, you can ask me, but uh, I hope you like the museum. I wanted to do a museum that was unlike any other museum. Each exhibit I wanted to draw you in, and I think that's what we've done, so. Because of Bruce, so anyway. before he has been an influence on so many people he's going to talk about someone who's been an influence on him as well as uh, tell us about these very interesting pieces. all right okay 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 well I'm going to uh, talk about uh, two geologists that uh, way way before me uh, one of the I see one of the people that uh, in the gas group here and uh, I don't probably some of you know what cylinder records are that's another one of my hobbies and I started that I started that when I, I was five years old. I spotted an innocent photograph in North St. Louis and knew what it was, and, and my dad bought it for me. And uh, you can see it on the you know, on the YouTube, the playing cylinders. Some of them going back as far as the 1880s. Anyway, I'm going to go back to the to the 19th century, the same way as cylinder records. And uh, the um, uh, what I what I'm going to go back to, but I'll, I'll just mention first of all. I had a whole series of slides on a flash drive, and I put them in one of these um, uh, pa the satchels, the one, and I made very specific note that 
they were in there and now gone and not there. This has been my whole week. And one thing after the other. So anyway, I'm sorry. I don't have some of those slides of those fossils, but I brought some, well, I'll bring fossils. People like to see fossils. So I did bring some a few of them out of my collection. And they relate to what I want to cover. And what I want to cover is two people who you may or may not have heard of. You may have heard of Charles Lyell. Anybody know who he was? Yeah. He's a found, considered by some as the founder of modern natural science. And his techniques and things were, and he's the one that, you've probably seen the geologic time scale. I have others, some of them in some books here. You see, when I was, wanted to bring one, but I had so much stuff, and uh, I probably would have gotten lost if I had made an attempt to bring it. But anyway, geologic time scale is a, divided up in a series of, of geologic time intervals. And it starts at 4.6 billion years, which is the age of the Earth, and it goes up to the present. And Lyell was the um, uh, more or less responsible for this, at least getting started and, and making up a lot of these terms that you hear, like Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Jurassic. That's one that people know because of Hollywood and money. That one they know. They, everybody knows about the Jurassic period of geologic time. That's, uh, that's in the Mesozoic era. And uh, Lyell was responsible for that. He was a, 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 a a Scotch, uh, uh, a British subject, lived in Scotland. And um, he was very interested in geology and very curious about it. Started writing in the 1780s, I think, started writing, wrote a series of books. And he continued to travel around. And I'm going to present his um, story, essentially, in from a book, the second uh, trip of North America, which the information essentially came out of this book right here. It's entitled, A Second Visit to the United States of North America, Charles Lyell, it's volume one and two. I got this uh, uh, nicely bound, and uh, it's very interesting, because I actually am involved with the uh, people mentioned in here. It's an interesting story, which guy kind of taped a little bit, got into a little bit, I'll just mention, means I mention this now. Uh, I got interested in fossils when I was a, a pretty little kid. I was 11, and I got really, really interested. The guy saw me about three years or four years later. I was uh, probably about 14, 15, you were, or maybe I was 16. I Somewhere around. You were born. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah. anyway, um, I uh, uh, got interested in fossils very strongly. Uh, I, first of all, grew up in an area that has a lot of fossils, where, where my parents moved to Ferguson. Now, people associate Ferguson with the horror story and the Ferguson effect and all of the Ferguson, yeah. But Ferguson is a really nice, still a nice town, although it's got some problems. And you know about the Michael Brownians. We won't get into that at all, but you know about it. But anyway, um, uh, I grew up in Ferguson. Ferguson was a very nice place, not only because it was just a nice place to grow up as a child, but there were a lot of rocks around in the creek and a uh, tributary of Malian Creek that uh, goes into, um, the Malian Creek was into the Mississippi River. And there was a tributary that flowed into Malian Creek, had some big rocks. And I was, we were sitting down there, I was probably 11 or so, and we were sitting on these rocks, and I started noticing these fossils. And uh, that looked, hey, those are neat. I knew what they were, but uh, I, uh, you know, the, didn't know what kind they were. I knew nothing about them, but I knew they were neat, and I, I got the bug. And uh, I had it strong, and I still have it somewhat strong. I, fossils are neat. They are, really are. They're very neat. And uh, uh, I uh, uh, decided a few years later to major in geology, and the guy kind of went over that. A very, very nicely guy. I appreciate that. Thank you. But uh, anyway, um, I uh, uh, started collecting fossils from uh, along this tributary of Mailing Creek and along the uh, behind where I live. I live there now. I, I live down in my parents' house. That, uh, my parents passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, I live on aging Patricia in Ferguson. And I like, I, I like Ferguson. I really do. I hope it doesn't, I hope some of the things I hear that, about it doesn't happen. Uh, but that's a whole different story. But uh, anyway, I, uh, I found fossils uh, behind where I live. It's an old railroad right away. It was built for the World's Fair. And uh, some of us I've gotten interested in, not so much from fossils, but from uh, early audio recordings. I have an interest, I have a strong interest. I, I, when I was 
way younger than when I was way younger when I got interested in fossils. And I uh, ran into a, a Edison fireside phonograph in a uh, jumble store in North St. Louis, and I knew what it was. And uh, it's kind of strange in a way, but I, I knew what it was. And there's always been a certain familiarity with with um, uh, early audio recording, particular cylinders. But anyway, um, um, I uh, uh, got interested in that, and uh, that kind of pulled me into the 19th century even more, because you're actually listening to it on, on cylinder records in many cases. You know, you're listening to something that in the same century Thomas Jefferson lived in and Abraham Lincoln and so forth. Anyway, well, I uh, 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 just built up a fairly decent fossil collection, of which I just happened to think. I left one of them at home. I, have, I used to put them on boards. Remember those boards? And I had one. <laughs> I was going to bring it, and I forgot it. Anyway, and, uh, and, uh, but we've got plenty of fossils here to look at. But anyway, I uh, started very, very intensely collecting, and uh, collected a uh, couple of pretty decent fossils from the big rocks there in Ferguson, when, when the first ones I collected. And I still have those. And uh, they were cephalopods, which we'll mention. These are cephalopods here, but these are no, no, coiled nautiloids. And these, the ones uh, from Ferguson, are straight cephalopods. Um, anyway, um, what I found out later uh, was, uh, well, I guess it wasn't too much later. I was probably about, uh, uh, probably, uh, maybe 13, or I probably, probably maybe was returned ready to turn 14, something like that. But uh, my dad <coughs> saw an article in the newspaper that they were, uh, would be a natural history museum established in Clayton, and, uh, in what is called Oak Mill Park. And he said, you know, you ought to go down there and, and check to see if uh, the, uh, whoever's curator of it, get to know them, and you'd, you'd probably learn a lot about fossils. Because I had all kinds of problems finding anything about fossils anything, any literature or anything. The only thing that I did get, my dad um, got me a book by uh, 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 John LeConte. Uh, it was a, from a used bookstore, uh, a, a jungle store, a natural history bookstore. But it was uh, from the 1850s. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was, uh, I found out LeConte was the geologist for this territory of California before it became a state, and he was a geologist during the gold rush. And uh, he published this book in the 18, 1853 or four so. And that book is when I learned a lot of my geology, and that was very, very good, because a lot of those concepts have come back later. For instance, it had something about plate tectonic, well, continental drift in there. And uh, I, my geologic education as an undergraduate, I had never heard of continental drift or anything much associated with it. And certainly I've never heard anything about uh, uh, what, what Bob Wagner, um, uh, the uh, proponent of continental drift. And here it was in this book by the Kant. And anyway, I learned some things that, that uh, you normally wouldn't by having this antique book. But uh, I uh, used that to identify a lot of the fossils. And some of them at that time were still, the names were still valid. I hate to say that now there's a, tendency in, uh, I guess it's something with the social media, maybe, I don't know exactly where it's coming from, but they're changing the names of these fossils. They're changing them. On the, there's a fossil coral in South St. Louis in the creeks, in Gravoy Creek, and, and its tributaries called Lithostrotionella, and that is no longer a valid name. It's now called Acrocyathus. And, uh, um, it's confusing for a number of reasons. <coughs> One is just the word, the name itself, besides the fact that you're changing names of things that are hard enough to remember, multi-syllable names, <coughs> biologic names that uh, most people are scared of anyway. And uh, when, you, when you change them, uh, you get doubly scared. And that. But uh, acrocyathus sounds like a, what's called an archaeocyathus. And to show you the intensity of my Fossil collecting. You never went to, you were at Newfoundland with me, but you never went to Labrador. I went to Labrador and I collected Archaeocyathus. Yeah. And, I, and, and the thing is, in Labrador, I was with my, that was my blue bomber I had. Some of you may remember that. It was a Caroline station wagon. 
and I had it geared up for long, for long trips. I had uh, stories. It was, it was very, very, very good mileage, 25 miles a gallon. So, but uh, I uh, um, drove to Labrador, and when I was in Labrador, I picked up a um, radio station from Ireland on my AM radio. <laughs> so, anyway. But I collected a number of fossils, including archaeocyathids, which are uh, very puzzling fossils that occur in the lower Cambrian. Now, the word Cambrian, you may have heard of that word, is the beginnings of complex animal life, or at least uh, complex and multiple types of complex <coughs> animal life. And uh, it's, it's a boundary in the geologic time scale. Uh, before the Cambrian, very primitive life. It's, some of it's not as primitive as it was originally thought, but it is um, a lot of it's pretty, 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 pretty primitive. In fact, much of it is is microbial. Much of it is blue green algae, or what used to be called blue green algae, it's now known as cyanobacteria, and uh, um, back, uh, photosynthetic bacteria, that kind of stuff. You know, the st stuff you study in microbiology, but it formed big reefs. And uh, in, the, in the oceans, because there was there was very other very few other forms of life, and one of the forms of life that the guy is familiar with are Edicarian organisms. And how many have heard of that term, Edicarian? Okay, some of you have heard it. It's uh, it, it is the complex life prior to the Cambrian. And if you get interested in the, a bug on this, I do have a book on uh, I, I my last project I've done is. To a series of books. This one is on, I call it Precambrian Mystery Fossils. And there's a lot of stuff here in Missouri. But uh, they're, they're not dinosaurs, they're not mammoths and mastodons, they're not even trilobites. They're, they're stromatolites and pond scum, some people say. Very, very primitive life forms. But uh, we do have this stuff here in Missouri. And I'm proud to say that I was the first one to discover uh, this sort of thing in Missouri on Culberson Mountain. There's an occurrence of what are called stromatolites that I had discovered. And I'm the first one to actually recognize that sort of thing in, in Missouri. And the rocks down in St. Francis Mountains, you know, the uh, very core of the Ozark southwest of here is, uh, is uh, that area, uh, Precambrian rocks, as they're called. Anyway, I, um, uh, I mean, I'm already starting to use a lot of the terms that originally were described by Lyell. Uh, and uh, Charles Lyell, uh, he was a lawyer. And uh, lawyers often have very good communication skills. And that's a necessary thing in geology. Uh, some of the concepts in geology are, are uh, they're, they're fairly simple. But uh, they, um, unless you can describe them adequately, they sound rather complicated. Not. But you're getting into mega time. You're getting into geologic time, and you know you measure geologic time in hundreds of millions of years and even billions of years, because the Earth is four point about four point six billion, billion years. That's B, billion with a B, and uh, not M million. I mean, it, there's a lot of difference between a millionaire and a billionaire in terms of wealth, and there's a lot of difference between between the. Uh, um, uh, Paleozoic era or the Mesozoic era, which are measured in million, hundreds of millions of years, and Precambrian geologic scale, which is measured in billions of years, and and that initially was started out by Lyell. It's been improved over the years, and a lot of the dates today are obtained through what's called radiometric age dating, using radioactive uh, occurrences and the fact of uh, radioactive decay is a regular phenomenon. That independent of temperature and, and, and uh, physics, essentially. And it will decay at a constant rate, so you can use this as a measurement of geologic time by measuring what's called a decay product to parent ratio, to parent nucleotide ratio. Anyway, um, Lyell was the one that, to piece this together initially. He was the founder of geologic time and the geologic time scale. So I'm going to go first of all and give you a little s survey or a little summary of the, um, this book, uh, the, the, the second visit to North America, and uh, what he did, he left um, <coughs> the world where he, where he lived uh, in uh, the uh, 18, 1832, 
and uh, he took steamer across the uh, boat. I managed to keep the Delqua. Um, actually, it uh, probably wasn't a steamer because I don't think steamers were running until it was later. It was probably a sailing boat. But he came across, docked in the East Coast, and um, uh, had made arrangements with um, probably um, uh, one of the people, uh, possibly David A. Owen, I have a perspective, may have been, to uh, uh, get a one of these little carts on the railroad tracks that had been recently laid across the northern part of Georgia and Alabama and uh, Mississippi, and uh, probably a slave to run it. This was pre-Civil War. And uh, anyway, he made a, on this hand cart, uh, looked at new cuts along the way of the right of way that was cut on that railroad that was recently built uh, in the northern parts of the states of uh, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. And uh, he looked at fossils, and one of his reasons for doing so, he was the author of the geologic eras of the Paleozoic era, the Mesozoic era, and the Cenozoic era. Those are the three eras of geologic time that have abundant fossils, have abundant life. It's known as the Panerozoic, that, that part. Prior to the Panerozoic is the Precambrian the topic of my book uh, that I have here, the um, Precambrian Mystery Fossils. And uh, the life in there is predominantly microbial, predominantly sometimes colonies, so you get mega fossils, but, but the actual organisms that form these things are little tiny, itsy bitsy bitsy teeny microscopic critters. So anyway, he, he wanted to um, check on the validity of the what he, uh, in intervals of the Cenozoic era that he des he describes, the Cenozoic era is sometimes called the age of mammals. That's when mammals become abundant on this planet. Prior to that, uh, they, mammals didn't exist. The first mammals appear in the um, uh, in, in the, in the uh, uh, Paleocene epoch. Well, they'll actually appear in the Cretaceous. But they're very small, very very inconspicuous, and he was. Um, uh, but he wanted to uh, check in other parts of the world, and, and particularly North America, because he had made a previous trip here to North America. But he was mainly up in the Canadian Maritimes and the, um, um, the, the um, uh, uh, New England states. And uh, the geology up there is a little different than the rest of North America, the right? rest of the United States. So anyway, he made this trip across <coughs> over to um, uh, um, around Montgomery, Alabama, uh, which is in, in uh, Montgomery's in the northern part of Alabama. And the, running right through Montgomery is the uh, Alabama River. And um, he um, had correspondence probably from, uh, might have been, uh, again, Owen or somebody in it locally here. Um, he also corresponded with, I, I almost uh, assume, or I, I'm fairly sure they correspond with some of the workers in the St. Louis Academy of Science. Because as you may or may not know, the St. Louis Academy of Science was one of the top leading scientific organizations in the 19th century. And they had people who were made a lot of very fundamental discoveries in, in various fields of science, in biology, uh, oh, in, in, in uh, the taxonomy of uh, Evergreens, I forget the guy's name, but there's an evergreen named at three. And um, uh, a, um, they, uh, uh, meteoritics, uh, there was a, um, but a number of people, they were at the cutting edge of science in the 19th century. And um, the, um, uh, uh, one of the, the people that um, uh, was, was a member of the, of the uh, say it was Academy of Science, a, um, a, a doctor, um, Lunsforth Yandel, um, he was a, uh, a physician in Louisville. And anyway, now here's where I come into it. When I was, when my dad told me that you ought to check out at the Science Museum uh, and find out somebody who may tell you more about fossils, I did. And I met Jim Hauser, who was a curator at that time. And he was the first curator. And Jim was a curator for much of the existence of the science 
Science Museum. Now that's not the Science Center. That's the facility on Big Ben and uh, in Clayton and at Oakville Park. How many have been there? How many are familiar with it? Okay, a lot of you are. They had a plastic T-Rex uh, uh, in the parking lot for a number of years and that mm -hmm. got a pretty big. So that was one of their, their things. But they had a lot, of, a lot of nice displays and that. Anyway, I went out and I met Jim Hauser and he, um, I, I started showing what I knew about geology, about fossils, and spewing off some of these big names, you know, that, some of the big names which had been changed. And uh, he uh, recognized my precociousness and my, my interest. And he said, you know, he said, uh, would you, how would you like to, um, uh, uh, we, we have a, we're given a collection, uh, and it's stored on Lindell. And it's all dirty. It's all covered with black soot. St. Louis was notorious for soot in the mid 19th century. In case you're not familiar with that, it was a big thing that they they did some some eradication of the soot from from uh, uh, soft coal uh, that was uh, being used in tenements and their, uh, apartments and so forth. And uh, anyway, the, uh, uh, the specimens specimens were all wrapped in newspaper. And the newspaper was covered with, with soot, and dirty black, and real crumbly because they were Civil War age newspapers. Anyway, I, uh, um, Jim said, well, we have this collection. It's never, it's been in storage for for years. On Lindell, he said, if you would um, uh, open it up, and all uh, these packages, and the labels were eaten by some insects, which I found out to be silverfish. Because when I opened the packages with the crumbling newspapers, when I'd open them up, all these <laughs> silverfish were running out. Of so it was literally an infestation of silverfish. And I found out later, well, actually, I figured it out when I was doing this, that they were eating the hide glue that the fossils and the labels had been glued together with. And that was food for them. And they were, they were living and growing inside of these packages for at least four decades or so, and, uh, and well, more than that, actually, because it turned out the newspapers were from the 1860s Civil War era, or 1870s, which is uh, uh, it's the beginning of sound recording now, it's 1877. At least Edison supposedly invented that in 1877. But uh, that's another story, totally different story. But anyway, I, I opened these up, and. A lot of the, the labels had uh, the, the name of this, uh, I felt he was a soulmate because I had, uh, could find nobody who knew anything about fossils and knew anything specific. And uh, they, my parents knew some things. They thought crinoids were fish bones and uh, <laughs> that sort of thing. They, they, they were familiar with fossils, but they were very erroneous in, in their identification of what they are and seemed like everybody else was too. So anyway, I was I knew what I was doing, and I relabeled these and uh, uh, best I could, and tried to copy the labels and, and come up with what they might be. Because a lot of the labels were were, were only a, a half or a third of the label was there. The rest of it was eaten by silver. Silver. <coughs> so anyway, um, um, I I through this met this. Um, Stranger, but who wasn't a stranger because he liked fossils, this Lunsworth Yandel of Louisville, Kentucky. Well, anyway, what I found out later was that that was one of the persons that Lyell would spend about two weeks with around Louisville collecting fossils. And I suspect some of the fossils in that collection at the St. Louis um, Academy of Science, I say, yeah, well, it was given to the St. Louis Academy of Science probably were, may have been collected by Lyell in Louisville on that trip. And that was the trip. But what, what, what he did, when I left Lyell in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, he, he, he worked around Montgomery a little bit, and there's a lot of uh, Cretaceous chalk. And uh, in that Cretaceous chalk, there's, um, I, I had a bunch of real good pictures of them. But was, they're oysters, exojara, ex and uh, around, um, um, uh, eastern Mississippi and on into Alabama around Montgomery, there are these chalk beds just full of these fossils. And some of you may have collected them or may know of them. You're familiar with the oysters around. 
probably the one where I remember them going one time uh, uh, later on, this my parents, around Tupelo, Mississippi. And uh, there was an area, an excavation, that was just loaded with them. And I found out later that that excavation was for Elvis Presley's house <laughs> that he grew up in. And uh, it was where they were doing the uh, parking lot and so forth. And, uh, and excavated in the uh, cell of chalk and uh, had uh, all these oysters were in there. There were literally hundreds and hundreds of fossil oysters. Anyway, but there's also the same chalk around Montgomery and, and Selma, Alabama, which is not too far from Montgomery. And uh, that chalk is full of those oysters. Well, anyway, um, what Lyell set up was a trip down the uh, Alabama River, and uh, which would include a trip up the Tom Bigby River and, uh, uh, and hit a bunch of fossil localities. Because uh, with steamboats, they wanted to have the steamboat loading air, landing areas that were high, that were higher than the alluvial, uh, 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 alluvial areas, which were lower and in during flood waters would be underwater. So they, had, they picked these areas that had these relatively soft uh, Gulf Coast sediments that were higher and could be a place for people to load and board uh, the uh, steamboats. And one of those is Claiborne, Alabama. And um, this is the first locality that Lyell spent collecting fossils from. It's a uh, famous locality for fossils. Guy and I have been there. We didn't find too much right at Claiborne. Uh, we, um, somebody probably had been there earlier and kind of somebody cleaned it out. It keeps webbing back their soft sediments. But we found these. Uh, this is from around Claiborne. And uh, these are the um, they're, they're called heraphoglosa. They're, they're, they're nautilus, essentially. They're essentially fossil nautiloids, and not nautilus. Uh, they're, they're cephalopods, which are mollusks. Mollusks that um, probably related to the octopus. And in fact, the octopus probably came from those. And an interesting thing about the octopus that's kind of current today, the octopus is a very intelligent animal. And you're hearing a lot of, today about AI, artificial intelligence. And the octopus is one of the models that's being looked at. Uh, for the evolution of, of, uh, in, of uh, intelligence in the animal kingdom. You always think of intelligence as associated with vertebrates, backbone animals like ourselves. But it actually, the mollusks and uh, some fish are, have, are fairly intelligent as well. And uh, to where the point, uh, uh, I, uh, well, I did eat octopus one time. I tried it, it was like eating rubber erasers. But uh, I, uh, I wouldn't want to eat them anymore. It would be like eating a, eating a dog or I don't know what, but they're, uh, they're, um, they're, uh, they're, they're pretty intelligent animals. That's, that's, that's one of the things that being looked at right now with the current interest in an AI. But uh, anyway, um, these fossils here are from the uh, area around Claiborne. And they're, they're not right at Claiborne, but they're only a few miles from that. And uh, they include, oh, uh, there's some small ammonites and a colony of them. And uh, they include, uh, this is a plant, this isn't from Claiborne, but it's from Kansas, but it's indicative of some of the very early plants. This is a sassafras leaf. And it's about the same as sassafras leaves today. This is a crab and uh, a couple other plants uh, from, uh, uh, actually from uh, Missouri. Uh, we have Cretaceous rocks on uh, Crowley's Ridge, uh, southwest of here. And uh, that's where these, these plants are from, from in that area. Anyway, uh, the Cretaceous is the, in the uh, Mesozoic era. The Mesozoic is the age, some, it's called the age of reptiles. This is when dinosaurs lived. This is the one that people get very excited about and all the things with dinosaurs. But also it's, the, it's an era that, that uh, housed, am, these are ammonites, which are, which are mollusks and which are related to the octopus. And these are, this is the nautilus, which is a, a related to an octopus as well. It's a, it's a mollusk again. Um, anyway, um, that is uh, around the Claiborne area, just a little bit north of there, there's some of it. And if you go down the Alabama River, which we're going to do in our mind, and this is where I had this, the, the, uh, the flash drive I was going to show the, the trip you know, with the fossils as we go down. But imagine you're in a steamboat and you're taking. Uh, on, off on the steamboat at Claiborne, where there's a bluff of the, uh, not Cretaceous rock, 
but uh, Paleocene at the base and above it uh, uh, of, um, uh, I don't where is it? Here, here, here. Of, right here, this group right here, of, of the Eocene age. Uh, the Paleocene and the, well actually the Paleocene was, was, was actually added a little bit later, but it's uh, Lyell's responsible for it. But these are uh, two terms, subdivisions of the Cenozoic era that was uh, the work of Charles Lyell. And they represent the subdivisions of the Cenozoic era. And the Cenozoic era, Cenozoic means young, ancient life. It's the youngest era of geologic time. And um, it includes uh, everything from the extinction event. You've all heard about the Chuxalu dinosaur extinction in Mexico, the, the astro asteroid that fell. And uh, it actually influenced some things here in Missouri. It influenced the um, embayment area uh, the, where the Gulf of Mexico came up into Missouri all the way to around Cape Girardeau. And that was influenced by that event. And uh, there's um, the dinosaur eggs that I mentioned are from that area down there. And uh, it's a very interesting area. There's some very interesting, probably some very, very interesting fossils yet to be found down there in that, in that Cretaceous rock. That's from the age of reptiles. But what, what Lyle was wanting to do, he wanted to, to check as he went down the Alabama River and, uh, and, and now a little bit up to Tom Bigby to check on his evaluation of the Cenozoic rocks in Europe, particularly in France where he spent a lot of time. And he uh, formulated these subdivisions of the Cenozoic era um, uh, for, uh, while in France and uh, wanted to see if the same nomenclature applied to North America. Because if it did, he, would, he felt much more secure than that that is probably a worldwide phenomenon. And it is. It's a, these, these patterns that you get of life, the, the uh, appearances and then the extinctions uh, are what designate the geologic time scale. And they're on large, large scale, they're major, major uh, characteristics of the evolution and the development of life on planet Earth. So he was dealing with something pretty significant. And anyway, he went down the um, uh, Alabama River and he realized that he would probably, the rocks would get younger as he went downstream. It would get, it would get progressively younger. And he would be going through mega time from the oldest, which is the Mesozoic era around Claire, near Claiborne, around, which is, which is uh, uh, a, a, a different era of geologic time that he also was responsible for uh, designating. And in fact, when he designated that, one of the um, subdivisions of that is the Jurassic period. And every American knows the Jurassic period, you know, because of Jurassic Park. That's, uh, that was when dinosaurs were discovered. And an interesting thing, I'm just, just mentioning that again, get back to my cylinder records and the, uh, the uh, early, early recording of sound. The Crystal Park was the site of the world's first World's Fair. And what do you think was the most popular thing at Crystal Park? And this was in the 18, uh, 1860s. The dinosaur models. Right, the dinosaurs, the dinosaur models. They, they had these di uh, dinosaurs uh, on display models of what they thought they looked like, and they were pretty, pretty accurate in some cases. Some of them weren't, they, but it was a whole series of them, which they, after the, the Crystal Park exhibition, which was the world's first World's Fair, they um, moved these to Crystal Park, which is outside of London, and which these models are sitting in, in ponds and that, and I had them on my, my thumb drive, but I didn't, <laughs> I left it home, so I don't see it. But it's it's neat. It's these these kind of weird looking dinosaurs because they were the first reconstructions of dinosaurs, and uh, much different than what Guy does. And uh, and I'm sure Guy's are much more much more accurate than uh, the Crystal Park dinosaurs. But these were the first 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 attempt at doing reconstructions of dinosaurs. And the word dinosaur came out of this. That's that was. Uh, that was um, uh, uh, acquaintance of Lyell that coined the word dinosaur, the word dinosaur, 
But uh, anyway, uh, that's uh, that's uh, dinosaurs were the, one of the top ex exhibits of the of the Crystal Palace exhibition. And uh, if we were to ask that about St. Louis, what what would be the top thing in the St. Louis? Because the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904 and the Chicago World's Fair in uh, 1893 uh, patterned themselves after the Crystal Palace exhibition. That was the template that essentially formed the model for uh, World's Fairs for about 70, 80 years, and probably still does to some degree. I don't know if there's any more recent one in a couple of the last 10, 20 years. But uh, anyway, the um, um, anybody know what the top thing in St. Louis one of the top things was in the St. Louis World's Fair, besides Anheuser-Busch beer. Baby, That's baby, sure. baby. What? Mastodons. Yeah, Mastodons were one. <laughs> but, but, but only one. The other, the other was the talking machine, which is one of my other interests. And, uh, and uh, that, was the, uh, that was one of the things that 1904, that was really big. People were getting talking machines in their homes, and more people could afford them because they went down in price. And that was a big topic in the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. Anyway, we'll get back to uh, Montgomery, Alabama, and Charles Lyell going down the river in the steamboat. And what he would do, you could, if you went out on the steamboat, you could get out, and they'd pick you up the next day on the next steamboat. They uh, um, they had. Uh, there's no uh, radio communication and they had telegraph, but I don't know the river had telegraph, I don't know, but they, they had some way to convey that information. And he would be picked up and then go down another few miles to another big outcrop and examine that and try to find, collect what fossils he could find in that. And he tried to compare those fossils with what he had collected in Europe. And he found there were similar patterns. That was the, the um, much of what he worked with were mollusks. These are mollusks here. And uh, he found that there was a similar pattern to the occurrence of mollusks. There was the same pattern of the extinction of the Mesozoic life forms like ammonites and all these coiled oysters like it found around Montgomery, Alabama and South Selma, Alabama. Those occur in Europe. And they, they had about to appear about the same time. So he had a higher, higher level of confidence that the stage, uh, the epochs that he was designating were actually really real and were not something just very lo local because he found the same pattern in North America occurring along the uh, Alabama River as occurred in, in a number of areas in Europe, in particularly England, Scotland, and France. So anyway, he went down the, the Alabama River, um, established these terms. Um, I mentioned the Cretaceous, which is the geologic period not a epoch. The rest of these are epochs, like Paleocene and Eocene, are subdivisions of the Cenozoic era, the age of mammals, where the Mesozoic, which includes the Cretaceous, is the, um, uh, known as the age of reptiles, or age of uh, uh, um, 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 uh, big, big reptiles, dinosaurs, and, and, and mosasaurs, and a number of other. Um, but anyway, the Eocene, uh, he recognized that. These are Eocene fossils from around the area of Claiborne and in Mississippi. Some of these are from uh, Blue Mountain, Mississippi, which is, which is essentially just west of Claiborne over in that area. And uh, the, uh, um, the palm that I think a uh, guy may have been on a trip away from this. This is from Arkansas, but it's from the same age rocks, just on the other side of the Mississippi River. So this is this is the Eocene period. And he found that a lot of the well not only animals, but a lot of the plants, including palms. We don't think of palms living in Alabama or Missouri or Arkansas today, but they did uh, during the um, the Eocene period. And they did probably because of the same reason that we're getting palms living better now, global warming. The, the uh, uh, carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere was high during the Eocene. The temperatures were essentially warmer. And uh, it, was, it was an example of global warming that you're hearing about today. Probably warmer than what we're, we're hearing about today. But anyway, it was an example of that. But uh, the, um, uh, after the Eocene comes the 
Um, Oliver was seeing this from right here. So we can see. Now hold them up first. Now we're right. He is seen, Oliver was seen, and that makes up the, the bottom half, the early half of the Cenozoic era, which is called the, the Paleogene. And then the last half of, of the um, Cenozoic era is called the Neogene. And that includes the Miocene period, the Pliocene, and I didn't bring any specimens on that one, uh, and the Pleistocene, which is the Ice Age. That's the one that uh, ice came as far down as St. Louis. If you go around um, on the Mississippi, oh, up uh, in North County and North City, there's boulders, uh, of some of them this big, big boulders, of pink quartzite that were brought down by the glaciers from the Baraboo Mountains in Wisconsin. And the Baraboo Mountains are an area, outcrops of Precambrian rock that's a good uh, almost 1,000 miles north of St. Louis, almost due north of here, north of St. Louis. And once you get to St. Louis, that's the end of the Ice Age deposits. But the Ice Age is the Pleistocene epoch. And then the, um, uh, after that is the Holocene. That's what we're, where we, we are in today. Or if you follow strictly the way it's working itself, this is still evolving. And it just about less than a year ago, they, uh, some group of uh, scientists got together, and I don't know if it's totally a uh, valid term or not, but they say that we are no longer in the Holocene, we are now in what they call the Anthropocene. And they, they judge that on the occurrence of all the plastic that's found on the ocean floor and uh, in, in incorporated in sediments of uh, modern day marine environment, which m most of these sediments we're looking at from these, these fossils here were also uh, uh, the animals and plants living, except for these, well, these are land plants here, but ammonites and tr uh, crabs and ammonite uh, uh, which Hold up some of the fossils first so people can see them. Oh, yeah. Well, we can come up here and I, you'll be able to see them a little easier. We can come up and move well, That palm's pretty nice, one. not you? Yeah, yeah. This, wow, well, that's obviously a land plant. Yeah. Um, so land. But uh, that's um, uh, um, the, uh, a lot of the fossil record is marine rather than, than terrestrial than life on land. Some of it is, some of the, these here are, are, are terrestrial and, and uh, plants. Um, anyway, he uh, continued on down the uh, Alabama River and he identified and tried to identify as many of these epochs along the Alabama River as he could. And when he got down around Mobile, he um, uh, now, glaciers did never get down there, so there's no glacial deposits, but there's there's deposits that uh, have a lot of mammoths and mastodons in them. Animals that are associated, both the bones of animals, the bones of mammoths and mastodons. And these are animals that lived during the Ice Age, and they were they were quite common around here and north of here. And uh, they, um, uh, they were in some of the, the uh, sediments around Mobile. Anyway, he took a steamer uh, from Mobile over to New Orleans, a coastal steamer. And then from New Orleans, which he was now into, uh, about in, uh, around Thanksgiving time, when he got to New Orleans, it was in the fall, fall of 1883. And uh, he um, uh, spent some time in New Orleans. And uh, this was before there was New Orleans jazz and such, you know, none of that. None of that. But uh, anyway, he, um, then made arrangements to get on a steamboat that would go up the Mississippi. And uh, that was in um, uh, November. And he got on the steamboat and it went up. And he stopped again, or got off and checked some of the outcrops along the Mississippi. One of them is Vicksburg, which is, uh, would later become a site, as you know, of the Civil War. But uh, at Vicksburg, he identified Algocene sediments on the basis of fossils that the geologic epoch of, of the Algocene and the Eocene were valid in North America. And if they were valid in North America, and he checked a little of that in, what, on his first trip in, in uh, uh, a lot of the Canadian Maritimes, and there's uh, some sediments there of that age, and he identified those as being correct, and, and identifying correctly with sediments 
that I've described in, in Europe. So he had a high level of confidence that this is an, uh, an international phenomenon. It's not just local. Because he was concerned that these fossil occurrences and these animal uh, abundances in some places were simply local events. And he found out that for the most part, they weren't. They were uh, events that were uh, 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 characteristic apparently worldwide. That was later proved even more thoroughly that, uh, that you can identify strata all over the world by fossils uh, as, to, as to its geologic age. And uh, anyway, um, he uh, went up the, the um, Mississippi. A couple of the things of interest, uh, he stopped one area, uh, it was around Vicksburg, and he took a, uh, um, I guess it was a, a stagecoach into um, uh, what at that time was uh, kind of the interior of Mississippi. And anyway, he uh, 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 identified and found a number of Ice Age animals, bones, mammoth mastodon. And uh, another one that's interesting, a ground sloth that had been named by Thomas Jefferson. That actually was the first fossil that was described from North America. Now, this was in the 1700s. This was like uh, I, after, right after the Revolutionary War, about in the early 1790s. But um, Jefferson described uh, a, a giant um, uh, ground sloth, uh, which became to be known as Megalonyx. Well, he described the genus Megalonyx. And uh, it was Megalonyx uh, gigantis, I think. And then it was later changed to Megalonyx jeffersoni. And uh, those do occur in the St. Louis area, in Coldwater Creek. In fact, the area where all this hallabaloo about the, well, the, um, the um, and it, I don't know, it's very low level. I took a Geiger counter, or a scintillator one time along there. The scintillators are very expensive, very, very sensitive, way more so than a Geiger counter. And I got very low readings. I did get readings of radioactivity, but they were very low. And they're making a big deal about that, as you may know, in the news media. I think, it's, I think it's overblown a little bit, but that's a whole different story. But anyway, that's, uh, that's the, uh, the, the place to see. And uh, there is in St. Louis and probably in St. Charles County some very interesting Ice Age deposits. And uh, I know in Coal Creek there's quite a few. I've got a bunch of mammoth uh, uh, bone, part of a skull, and uh, very good sized chunks of bone that I'm I don't put, uh, I, I don't want them under my bed anyway, but uh, some people put, put the, uh, fossil bones under their bed, like big dinosaur bones. And some, some dinosaur bones can have enough uranium in them to actually be a source of, of, of radioactivity that's serious and can give you cancer. So uh, my advice is don't put dinosaur bones under your bed. <laughs> Why? Uh, what, why? Uh, they absorb the phosphate. No, 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 no. Why would you put bones <laughs> under your bed? <laughs> I guess so they're stored. They're big and bulky, and you can slide them under your bed. And you can put that space in there. That's not to keep the boogeyman out. I Maybe mean, I think mean, I mean, it's just a way to place to store them. You know, put them out of the, get them out of the way. But, but a lot of dinosaur bones can, not all of them, but, but a lot of fossil bones can have uranium in them because of the uranium is uh, attractive. <coughs> characteristic of calcium phosphate. Anyway, um, we get the, he goes up the Mississippi River by steamboat, and this was, by the time he got on the steamboat, he got up, uh, out of New Orleans and started working north. It was in December. And this December, they had a lot of rain. They had a lot of heavy rains, kind of like we've had in the last few months of, of this uh, year and the, early, in the latter part of uh, 20, uh, 22. Uh, and anyway, the Mississippi went up. Uh, it was, and I won't say in flood, but it was up enough to where there were root wads coming down. And you know what root wads are? They're, they're trees that have been uprooted during high water on the Mississippi or on, on a big river like the Mississippi. And the steamboat captain got concerned when they got up around Cairo, Illinois, that they might run into one of those. And if they did, it could cause, cause the, boat to, the steamboat to sink. So he docked at Carroll. And uh, uh, 
Lyell was going to go up the Mississippi to St. Louis, probably visit the St. Louis Academy of Science people. But um, the uh, river was uh, uh, too many rot root wise, so he was in Carroll, and what did he do? Well, he thought he'd change his itinerary of his trip a little bit and go visit a friend of his who lived in New Harmony, Indiana. And uh, that friend was um, David Dale Owen, who was a uh, federal, or a part of the, uh, the, the book that he published, this big blue book that I have here is, is the Treasury Department, but the uh, organization that he oversaw was apparently part of what was called the um, uh, um, Corps of Discovery, which is the same government agency that Lewis and Clark operated in, or, or related to it, and some of the people may still be in We're talking about the, you know, we're talking about the 18, uh, 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 well, it, 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 yeah, still the 1830s, you know, so it was, those were intact. But uh, anyway, he, uh, was going to go up to St. Louis, but he was concerned that uh, about the <coughs> steamboat. I guess the steamboat captain was concerned that the, those root lots would be too much of a problem. So anyway, he got on a out of Carroll. He got on a, a um, uh, um, conveyance, land conveyance, which was a, 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 a surrey with the fringe on top. Okay, a, a stagecoach. And uh, he went to New Harmony, Indiana, where uh, Lye, uh, where uh, uh, Luka, oh. David Dale Owen lived, and uh, spent about a week or ten days, something like that, with Owen. And uh, Owen was was designated to outfit a group of canoes that would be hauled up the Mississippi River to go up rivers on the west side of the Mississippi, uh, above Missouri, which means that what were then territories, the territory of Iowa and the territory of uh, Minnesota, and also on the other side of the river, the territory of Wisconsin. These had yet to be states, and uh, these, uh, these were, though, being looked at as for, for future statehood. And what they would do would take a, 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 a big boat hauling canoes, and they would unload the canoes at the mouths of the rivers that flow into the uh, Mississippi, and they would go up those rivers and examine the outcrops. And in case you're not aware of it, I mean, some of the best outcrops that you can get to for fossils, and Guy will attest to that with me, are found along rivers, and particularly where the fossils are in limestone. They weather out beautifully. And it's one of the one of the best places to collect fossils. And uh, Owen was a fossil collector. He was interested in, in fossils. He was interested in geology, and he was he was one of the founders of geology in North America. And anyway, they um, uh, uh, Lyell and Owen, you know, I guess interacted and discussed things for about a week or ten days or so. And then Lyell went to went from New Harmony, Indiana, over to. Um, um, uh, Louisville, and there he met Lunsworth Yandel, and Yandel, uh, he's the one that that put together the fossils that I cleaned when I was a kid, and uh, uh, Yandel um, and Lyell went fossil collecting around Louisville, which is very fossil rich, and I always noted when I was cleaning those, there were a lot of fossils from Louisville, there were a lot of crinoids, there were a lot of, there were blastoids, lots and lots of corals. If you go up to Washington U, You'll see in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, they have a little museum there. Nothing like you have here. It's nowhere as big as this, but it's nice. But they, it's full of these big corals from the Falls of the Ohio. The Falls of the Ohio was uh, a um, uh, coral reef during the Devonian period and the Silurian period, two periods of the Paleozoic. And they, uh, uh, Lunsworth Yandel collected a lot of those. And I think what happened, I think later on, a guy who I met when I was out at Washington U, he just retired, he would retire shortly, his name was Courtney Warner. I think he was there, uh, 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 well, he wasn't that, that early. I think uh, he was there in the late 19th century, I believe, in the 1890s. And he retired in the uh, 19, 
I guess or early 60s or so, or 50. Yeah, he was out there when I would go out there when I was a kid, in my, my late mid-teens. And I think he had something to do with, with uh, getting these from the St. Louis Academy of Science that they were originally sent to, or willed to, by Lunsworth Yandel. So anyway, um, the, um, uh, these corals and uh, all these fossils that I was working on came through Lunsworth Yandel of, the, um, of, of Louisville. And uh, uh, it's an interesting connection with, with Lyell, because Lyell knew him, and uh, they, uh, they probably shipped some of that stuff. I know a lot, a lot of Lyell's fossils are in the British Museum now. And there's probably fossils from, from maybe that trip collected, probably it is, from that trip that uh, Yandel and uh, 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 Lyell collected around Louisville, and probably some of those were sent to London. They're probably in the British Museum now, still there. I they, they, uh, but uh, that's just conjecture. But another, though, interesting conjecture I want to get into, uh, there is at the Science Center a whole bunch of Ice Age megafauna bones, mammoth, mastodon, uh, maybe um, uh, the giant ground sloth, I don't know, I know there's a lot of, I've seen a lot of mammoth and mastodon, no labels. And I think the reason it's no labels is that they were glued with high glue. <laughs> Silverfish were feeding on that. But uh, they have that out there. They have no idea about where they're from or anything about them. And I think that they should be aware of this. I tried, I was out there, uh, uh, one of the books I did, well, the uh, uh, more paleozoic fossils. I, I photographed some fossils I gave, uh, I guess, 30 years ago to the Science Museum at Oak Park. And that ended up at the Science Center at their collections facility. And they have on the corner of Manchester and Kings Highway, on the southwestern corner is the collection facility of the St. Louis Science Center. And they have all these collections in there. And uh, some of it occasionally gets shown in the, in the actual museum there. On, on Highway Party, but uh, a lot of it doesn't. A lot of it just in there, including these big, big bones of Pleistocene age. I have a suspicion that those are from Big Bone Lick, which is south of Louisville and now State Kentucky State Park, and th that is where uh, Lunsworth Yandel collected those originally. And an interesting aspect of those that I find interesting historically is that that locality was collected by Benjamin Franklin. Now that's early 18th century. That's that's really getting back there for paleontology. That was in the uh, uh, the early uh, 18th century. They were still into things like fossils, were devices of, of the devil and all that. You know, some of this really <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> the, the fossils are from the flood and all that. Yeah, Mike. Not Jefferson. Franklin. Yeah, yeah, Franklin. Yeah, Benjamin Franklin. Yeah. And Jefferson described. Yeah, the Jefferson described. I, I just assumed he collected it. Just he did. Uh, yeah. Well, Jefferson was much later. Later. Well, he wasn't that later. But but Franklin was older than Jefferson. Right. And and Franklin was was uh, born sometime in the early. I think, oh, I know. I just I always assumed yeah. since <laughs> since he described it, he collected it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not too sure whether he did or not. It may have been already in the collection. Of, uh, ah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know so that. Can take us on a field trip so we can get our own? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, that is kind of nice. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, enough work and, and really did what they wanted you to do. You could get title to it. And uh, that's the way a lot of farms in Missouri and, and in the Midwest became uh, farms and private property rather than property that was originally in the federal government, because it, before that was property in France with the Louisiana Purchase, you know, the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, which, by the way, is what the St. Louis um, World's Fair was about. That was the, the, the uh, Louisiana Purchase Exhibition, and that was in 1803, not in 18, 1804. But um, anyway, um, his, his chore was to take this core, uh, group of uh, canoes up these rivers, which included Missouri, but and there's a the um, 
the Salt River and the, um, I think, the Wyaconda and a couple of uh, rivers here in Missouri, uh, which uh, have the fossil localities. And this is one from, from the Salt River um, in, uh, around in Rawls County. And that is mentioned in that book. And what I did years ago when I got that, I got, I went more into it, read through it, and found it just interesting. But found these localities where he mentions these fossils and said, hey, I'm, I can go there. I've got a canoe. And I did. I'd go and load it up on my blue bomber and, and go up there and, 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 and uh, coast this road, uh, road crossing and put the canoe in and go up to that locality. There it was. And you, you've been to some of them, Guy. You, know, you, could, you knew how I did that. And that was very successful because I got a lot of nice fossils doing that. It's a very, very successful way. And it's just the weathering <coughs> along rivers and creeks to, to some degree too. But but rivers seem to be just the ideal for fossils weathering out in, in relief. And uh, the, the weather, just the, the, the combination of weathering and humus and that along the river is uh, ideal. So anyway, that's what I did. And, and I hit these various localities and I have a few of them. Um, this also is from Missouri. I brought it because it's just, it's a big trial point. and it's missing part of the head until in here. But, but that is also from up in Rawls County, right, just right below the rivers. Uh, well, anyway, we went. Uh, I went and checked out here in Missouri I, the, the um, Salt River and the Wyaconda. There's a lot of crinoids on Wyaconda, and uh, they're along the river outcrops, and they take a lot of time to prepare. They're they're hard to they're very laborious to prepare them, but they're very nice. Some of them are very nice. Uh, I think a couple of big takeaways from hearing your presentation yeah, yeah. is one, you know, there's not that much written information about all of this. So okay. we thank you for your body of work oh, that you've put together. Yeah, well, and, I've got um, my book. Yeah, yeah, so that's wonderful. And uh, another takeaway is you don't have to go to um, you know, Egypt or, or wherever to find big fossils and big finds like that. They're here in Missouri. Uh, yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. you just have to have the know-how and exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And you'll find some good stuff. Also thought it was interesting. One, one woman here was a student of yours in Fox. Dinosaur project where the Missouri dinosaur was found in southeast Missouri. Uh, they can address that uh, or any number of things. That's totally up to you. This is your time to ask the experts. So take it away. And oh, you may sit or stand a, wherever you like. There wouldn't be a Missouri Ozar dinosaur project without her. He had the foresight to acquire that property. He wanted to, why don't you talk about that a little bit? Okay. How that came to be. Are you familiar with how the Missouri dinosaur came to be? Want to hear that story? It's kind of interesting. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll start. Are you going to start? Why don't you start? Oh, they mean, hey, I'm, I'm writing a book on this. Yeah, Mike's writing a book on it. It's called Monster in the Hollow. And there's a web page on it, too. Type in Monster in the Hollow on, on uh, Google. You'll, uh, you'll find his web page. Well, it's, it's a YouTube video in a public library in St. Louis County. That this is, it's a little out of date. It's not like about 2016. Uh -huh. But they videotaped my talk. Yeah, right. It's good. It really is. Yeah, it's very informative. And, and, uh, and I okay, don't well, use your, your flash drive. <laughs> so um, the story of the Missouri dinosaur, well, of course, technically begins back in the Cretaceous, about 75 million years ago. Um, Essentially, there was a body of fresh to possibly brackish water that existed down 30 miles west of what is today Cape Girardeau, Missouri, when at that time, Missouri was part of the Gulf Coastal Plain, similar to, say, southern Louisiana. And uh, our dinosaurs got themselves washed into the lake and buried in some clay. 
And now, fast forward to 1942. A family by the name of Cronister, the head of the family is Lula Cronister, known affectionately as Lulu Cronister. <laughs> she and her children were living in a ramshackle small house and they were digging a cistern in back of the house. And this is one of these happy accident kind of situations. It's a little bit like the opening sequence of the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> um, in that a geologist named Dan Stewart, who was working for the Missouri Geologic Survey, and they, this was part of the bore effort. They were looking for clay deposits for ceramics and other uses. Well. Dan just happened on to the Cronister property at precisely the right moment in time. If he'd been there a year earlier or a year later, when they were no longer digging, we wouldn't know anything about dinosaurs because the dinosaur remains do not weather out on the surface. But the family was digging a cistern and he happened onto their property. He was looking at a creek bank, looking at some clay in the creek bank, when a little boy popped his head over the top and said, Hey, mister, what you doing? He said, well, I'm looking for clay deposits. I'm with the Missouri Geologic Survey, and this little boy is named Ole, Ole Cronister, O-L-E. It's not Ole, it's Ole. <laughs> and he said, well, why don't you come on? We got some clay back to the house. So he followed Ole back to the house where Ms. Lula said, yeah, yeah. And there was a big pile of clay right next to the hole that had been dug. And he noticed that there appeared to be some fossils in there. And she brought out some that they had pulled out. And he knew that these were not some old cow bones or deer bones or whatever. Because these were backbones. And there's plaster casts of them on display downstairs. The originals are in the Smithsonian. And some of those suckers are, you know, that big around. And he knew that, A, A he knew that these clays down here were Cretaceous. And he knew the only animals that were that big in the Cretaceous were dinosaurs. So he took them back to Rolla, and eventually they got examined, and they said, the Smithsonian is the place they ought to be, so they loaded up the bones and they sent them to BC. <laughs> <laughs> and the dinosaur expert at the Smithsonian, Dr. Charles Gilmore, looked at them and said, these are tail vertebrae from a dinosaur. And so in 1945, a scientific paper was published by Gilmore and Stewart, describing this, uh, originally described as Neosaurus missouriensis. He had to quickly make an addendum to that because shortly after the paper was published, somebody pointed out to Dr. Gilmore that you can't use that name. It's already been used by Natska, who was a paleontologist in Europe. So he had to publish a little note, clarifying note. It's Parasaurus missouriensis named after a man named Parr, not Jack Parr, for those who are old enough to remember the early days of the Tonight Show. <laughs> so, Parasaurus missouriensis, he thought it was a sauropod, which is you know, the long, in fact, somebody, lady had a shirt on with all kinds of dinosaurs on it. Yeah. Don't know if she's still here. Yeah, there she is. She thought, I think there's a sauropod or two on her yeah, shirt. Long neck, long tail. <laughs> Although, to be fair to, to, to Gilmore, he did say in the paper that maybe it was a duckbill dinosaur. Well, in the 1980s, more bones were found. Thanks. Oh, okay, sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Nothing more was done with excavation of the site until the 1970s and 80s when Dr. Stinchcomb got permission from Ole, who was now the owner of the property. Ole gave Bruce permission to do some excavations, and then Bruce outrightly purchased. The original homestead, the building, was, the house was still there, and um, he did some excavations of his own, and he started finding more bones. And the bones that Bruce was finding, and he also then did some digs in conjunction with some people from the New Jersey State Museum, Dr. David Paris and Dr. Barbara Grandstaff. Grandstaff, they came down and did joint excavations with Bruce, and based on the bones that they were finding, this is this is not a sorrow. This is a hadrosaur, a duckbill dinosaur. Well, in the late 1980s, on through about 2009, Guy Darrow and myself conducted a series of very painstaking, at times downright tedious, excavations under enclosures. 
and keep the water up. Because see, if you don't, if you don't put something over the excavation, it fills up with water and you got a frog pond. Well, frogs don't collect fossils for you. <laughs> we tried training and we didn't work. <laughs> the turtles weren't interested either. <laughs> so and, and keeping the water out of an excavation is a real challenge. Water is insidious. It will just get into all kinds of mischief. So we, we continue to find more bones, including there's a, a partial skeleton on display downstairs. I've been working on that sucker off and on for 20 years now. I finally started taking the bones out of the uh, actual plaster. I've got an upper end of the upper arm bone that's on separately on display. Um, we're not, Guy and I are not doing the excavation anymore. Uh, in, t in 2009, our greenhouse was destroyed by an ice storm, a freak ice storm we went through it January or February of 2009. And it was heartbreaking to see two thirds of the, of the greenhouse was collapsed. So Guy decided, okay, our, our phase of doing this is probably over. We're gonna look for another group to work with. And he did indeed finally make connections with a group at the Chicago Field Museum. And Guy got the resources to put up a new greenhouse. And so since about 2017, all the more recent excavations are being done by this crew from the Chicago Field Museum um, under the supervision of Professor Peter Makovicki, who he's now with the U University of Minnesota, but he was originally at the Field Museum. And they are finding some incredible stuff, including the revelation that our dinosaur isn't a hadrosaur. Yeah. It's a hadrosauroid, which sounds like a duck-billed dinosaur with hemorrhoids, but uh, <laughs> apparently it's more primitive than a hadrosaur, but more advanced than an iguanodon. And what led to this revelation was they discovered our Missouri dinosaur has thumb spikes. Hadrosaurs, true hadrosaurs, don't have thumb spikes. Iguanodons yeah. have thumb spikes, and hadrosauroids, some of them have thumb spikes, but not true duck-bills. So our idea of what kind of a beast this is, is evolving. First they thought it was a sauropod, then they thought it was a hadrosaur, now they think it's a hadrosauroid. So who knows what they'll think it is 10 years from now. But right now, and it just, this happens in paleo all the time. You, as you find more parts of the animal, you get revelations. And there were some clues before the thumb spikes that it had some affinities to iguanodons, but, but that was kind of the clincher. So anyway, none of this could have happened without Bruce, because he was the one that acquired the property so that it wouldn't be developed as a farm or a subdivision or whatever. It's the only place in the whole state of Missouri where dinosaur remains have ever been found. I mean, they may be out there somewhere, but so far, this is the only spot. So, three cheers for Bruce. was um, one of the dinosaurs uh, in the Crystal Palace exhibition. Yeah, that's right. Uh, they, I had pictures of it on my... They put the thumb spot on its nose. Yeah, 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 they put it up where the nose is. Sure. It's, 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 it's actually like a thumb, but it's in the opposite direction. And they had it walking on all fours, like yeah. a giant iguana. Well, there's a there's a reconstruction of it in the Crystal Palace, exp uh, Crystal Palace Park in, in London. And uh, it's uh, Hawkins, yeah. I think his name was, wasn't it? Yeah, um, house, well, um, well, he's Hawkins. the one that re made those reconstructions, right? But it was the um, designation of the Guanadon was um, uh, Owen, yeah, uh, um, the last name was Owen, I forget his first Richard name. Owen, yeah. Richard Owen, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Richard yeah. Owen, yeah. and he was a close friend of Lyell, so, yeah. Lyell is considered one of the founders of modern natural science um, uh, text, well, procedures that's done in modern, uh, except for changing names. I don't think he told that. I, that uh, is kind of a, but. Uh, so are there only two dinosaurs in that place you're digging, or are there lots more little pieces of other? Uh, there's little more pieces. bones are coming out all the time. So yeah. don't, don't you find the whole dinosaur in one place? Uh, finding a complete dinosaur is something you see in Jurassic Park movies, and it does happen, 
But it's the exception, not the rule. Most dinosaur fossils are based on fragmentary remains. Yeah, I'll mention one thing having to do with that, uh, with Lyell. When he came up the steamboat from New Orleans, he stopped off at the site of the 11, 1811, 1812 earthquake. And he um, uh, had a connection, I guess probably through uh, uh, maybe the Lunsworth man, Mandel or, or David Owen, but with the landowner, and he lent him a, 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 a horse. And he was, a, a, as most people were in the 19th century, accomplished horseman. Mm -hmm. And he drove all, rode all around and documented, the best documents mm -hmm. of that earthquake is that done by Lyell and uh, on this uh, trip uh, th this trip in the 1830s. And that was, you know, it's fairly fresh still mm -hmm. in the 1830s because the earthquake was 1811, 1812. And the other thing with that, the Cranister site, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Missouri Dinosaur site, the bones, many of them are very severely broken. And apparently, the bones are found in clay, fairly, uh, uh, um, very tenacious clay. And apparently, there's been seismic activity in that area, and it's broken the bones and fractured them. So it's really challenging piecing these together. You not only have to get the individual bones, but you have to find the pieces and glue them together, and glue them together correctly. So it's a, it's a chore. Mike has done a lot of that. He's he's been a real hero in piecing together and, and with patience because it's it's like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle, and it takes some 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 know-how and some patience to piece that all together. Multiple yeah. three-dimensional jigsaw puzzles with all the pieces mixed up. And with the pieces <laughs> mixed up. Yeah, some of them thrown out. And, and maybe a few of them was from some other puzzles too. Yeah. Yeah, the clay has been folded and it's been folded. And in fact, the one that's on display downstairs, the shoulder blade, is bent over the arch of what we call an anticline. So as the earthquake happened, or the plates were moved, then it shifted and broke them up. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's probably, we have, you know, drive down I-55 at night this afternoon, driving down, or when, this morning, I guess. Uh, you notice that, you can see these beds are all tilted. You've got yeah. a really, really very beautiful section of, of the, the St. Genevieve Fault System. And there's some weird stuff on that. Yeah. There's one thing is that I found over around Womack in that fault, in that, in that complex. Um, it's in a couple of my books. It's a, a um, very, very primitive life. It's called conophyton. And it's a, it's a cyanobacteria, but it forms cones. And the cones look like monoplacophorans. And that's what I, when I first found it, I thought I found a group of monopl monoplacs. And I was now aiming, and I sawed it, or I put, when I sawed part of it to cut some of the rock away, I saw a different, totally different pattern. And those sort of monoplacs look like, look like uh, uh, stromatolites at that time, and now they're called microbialites, which is a better term, because these are really aren't stromatolites. But they're, they're associated with geothermal activity. And that's kind of a giveaway because uh, this St. Genevieve fault system goes into the Earth's mantle. There's, there's occurrences of, of, um, of uh, uh, peridotites uh, so in, in there. And, and the that's peridotites called by, in the Earth's mantle. Called by volcanic action. Well, it's uh, deep seated. Okay. Vol it's volcanic, but it's very deep. Oh, it's from the mantle. That's like 20 that's miles like below the surface. Plants, right? Yeah, well, no, it's just below the crust. It's below the crust. Oh. That's the mantle is below the crust. And this is, these are samples of the Earth's mantle. Yeah. Another interesting thing I ran into around here, uh, um, one time, uh, uh, Azor, you know, they're, they're quarrying over there, and the, that's the Grand Tower limestone. And the Grand Tower, by the way, is part of that St. Genevieve fault system. The Grand Tower is on the Mississippi, just south of here, not too far. And um, that is um, uh, associated with the, with the fault system, and is, um, what was I gonna say about it? Uh, well, it's, um, Grand, Grand Tower. Grand Tower, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was Zora. And the, um, the, um, I, I saw about, I guess it was 20, 15, 20, 20 years ago, a, a big uh, tra tractor trailer going uh, open one with big blocks of black limestone on it coming out of that road there, comes from, goes to Zora. 
And uh, I was wondering, what the heck, I thought they were quarrying that again. And uh, it was going down I-55. And I was kind of curious about it. And I, um, I, I bought a property in um, Jefferson County uh, that, um, I was thinking for a while of building back there. And I don't know, I decided it was, it was lonesome. I'm, 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 I like Ferguson. <laughs> I, 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 but anyway, a friend of mine and his, and his girlfriend lives there. But uh, we, we got marble at Home Depot. And when I opened it up, the, the packages of marble, it's made, in, it's polished in China. It says made in China, product of China. But I looked at the marble and that looks like a Productus missouriensis. It's a species of brachiopod that's characteristic of the Devonian named after Missouri. Missouriensis is a, is a species name. And uh, I said, what the heck, that's, what's that doing in uh, rock from China? And then I thought of that big block going down I-55, and I looked into it, and what they're doing, they're taking big blocks of rock like that, and they're putting them on ships, and they're going across the Pacific to the Orient, and uh, bringing uh, ships back that have brought loads of material from China to sell in Walmart and to sell in uh, and, uh, stores here in the States. And uh, this, uh, they have these boats then that they bring over here, and they need something for ballast to balance the boat to keep it from being too, too tippy and from waves. So they get these big blocks of rock from the states, oh, okay. and then they bring them over to China, <laughs> and they so they cut them and polish them, and they sell them back to us. was <laughs> 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 the uh, same marble that they used to house the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah, well, that used to be widely used. Yeah. Very nice marble. And another interesting thing about that, it isn't true marbles. No. It's, 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 a, it's a product of metamorphism, but it's a different kind of metamorphism than dynamic metamorphism. True marble forms under mountain building, dynamic, mar uh, dynamic mar uh, mountain building. The hot squeeze. The hot squeeze, right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that would be from the Avon uh, district. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, the... Um, uh, they really, uh, none of the marbles in Missouri are uh, uh, true marbles. True marbles. Yeah. They're, they're, I mean, that is, in a way, it is marble, but it's, it's, it's different. It's not dynamic metamorphism. It's, it's a nice different thing kind of thing. Yeah. 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 yeah, I was going to ask a question. Yeah. No. Uh, in an earlier, when you talked to you, you said you found a dinosaur egg. Now, I remember yeah. we collected as a group at your site in Areola. Uh -huh. Now that's that's where you found the egg, the dinosaur yeah. egg. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what kind of dinosaur it's from? No, I, I think it's a hadrosaur. So there's uh -huh. two spots you can find eggs. In fact, eggs are almost as important yeah. as like yeah. bones. Yeah. You find yeah. bones and eggs. Yeah. The lady with the red shirt. Yeah. Okay, so you were talking about the bone that <clears throat> had curved to the anticline. Wouldn't it have been soft in order to form it like that? No, no, the uh -huh. forces involved are so great. The clay is yeah, plastic. Yeah, clay is, yeah, clay, clay is plastic. So in other words, because it's adjacent to a fault, the friction between the two sides of the fault has caused the clay to warp. Mm -hmm. And the bones were already in the clay, and the bones, the bones, it's, it's all cracked. Oh, OK. It, it didn't get bent without being damaged. There's a considerable amount of the fracturing of the of the, the shoulder blade, oh. which you can see if you look at it, it's it's a nightmare. Putting it back together is going to be three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, I'm not looking. For Where you've broken all the pieces up and thrown them out, some of them, and then you well, at least these are in contact. But still, taking the pieces out individually yeah. and gluing them back together. It's oh well. Just scary. <laughs> yeah, I should, I'm not sure I'm going to live long enough to finish prepping that, that block <laughs> at the rate it's going. Are there a lot of young boys in our world that are interested in oh, your work? <laughs> our work, I don't know, but, but definitely a lot of the kids that come through the museum here, uh, you know, the parents will say, oh, my child wants to be a paleontologist. And very few of them will probably go on to be paleontologists, but that's okay. It can be a, a gateway to a lot of different things. Even if they just grow up to be a, an amateur fossil collector, that you know they can make contributions too. Amateurs can find some really important fossils if they work with professionals. 
and I'm not doing the excavation anymore, so the person that actually asked that would be Pete Mekavicki, who's in charge of the current excavations. And they have a crew of young folks, and but honestly, they had a whole crew of elderly individuals who stayed in Jackson and, and or they had to schlep them back and forth from Jackson to the dinosaur site. And there was a lady in there who, she must have been at least in her 80s. And she was digging it. Just, I was impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I should have that kind of stamina when I'm as old as that lady. So, so not just kids, but even older folks have worked down there. Not, not recently, but they, yeah, they have a whole crew from the Field Museum. And I don't know whether I'd call any of them kids, although I guess by my age. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm se I'll be 74 in June, so. But uh, More questions? children, no. It probably wouldn't be safe for children. Is that Gulfian series, or what, what part of the Cretaceous is that? Well, the current idea is that it's Campanian, which is not latest. It's not Maastrichtian. But Pete Makovicki says he has suspicions it may be older than Campanian. Huh. The problem is we can't find any spores and pollen in the darn clay, which would really help to nail down the age. But the, <laughs> but the people from the, the New Jersey State Museum were pretty convinced it was Campanian, so I wasn't going to argue with them. They know more about it than I do. Uh, but it might be older. Surely so, we have some more questions for oh. Bruce or Mike. Oh, right here, right here. Orders. Oh. the man oh. of the hour, after all. Uh, hey, is there a KT boundary line visible in Missouri? Yes. Well, yeah, I'm cool. speak more to that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah in, in the first one, the KT boundary is this, um, uh, apparently, uh, and I think, I, I believe it's true, that uh, there was an asteroid that landed in Mexico. In the, yeah, uh, it's absolutely uh, northern North, North Mexico. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, the um, uh, it uh, did a lot of damage. I mean, it made a huge tsunami in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, and big enough that apparently a big wave went up the the um, extension of the Gulf of Mexico in, into Arkansas, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Missouri is is called the um, uh, the um, embayment, yeah, mm -hmm. the known as the embayment, and there's a big, huge tsunami went up there from that impact, uh -huh. and as it went up, it ripped up clay from the bottom of the of the estuary, and uh, ripped up big chunks of it, and uh, forming what are known as uh, um, uh, clay hunks or just chunks of clay, and uh, the um, there's uh, in the back wall of the Diggings at the uh, uh, Ardeola site. Ardeola is the nearest town. It's not very far from there. And this is on Crowley's Ridge, which is a, a, a probably a tied in with the 1811, 1812 earthquakes in some way. That that whole area has been seismic, seismically active for millions of years, and probably was seismically active. Well, it was probably the faults out here on I-55 are probably related to to that whole area. It's a seismically active area in southeastern Missouri. It's a lot of stuff you see around here. It's kind of weird sometimes. And probably it's from that site. It's all that earthquake activity. But um, the um, um, uh, let's see what I'm going to say here. I'm KT boundary. Yeah, yeah, the KT boundary. Yeah, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so many uh, things. The KT boundary is uh, an extension event that was worked out by Lyell, get back to the topic of it here, with Lyell and, 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 uh, and, and Owen, but mostly Lyell's, when his trip down the uh, Alabama River, what he was looking for is this sudden, sudden change of fauna. And you find that around um, uh, Claiborne. You find that around Claiborne and uh, Montgomery in that area. You have, you have late Mesozoic rocks around there, which are, are, are relatively salt, they're chalk, but they're full of Oysters and there's mosasaurs have been found there. Um, the, um, they're typically organisms associated with the Mesozoic era, associated with the uh, 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 
Mesozoic extinction event because they go extinct. <laughs> Sondra is also down, but that's here in Missouri. Yeah, well, it is here in Missouri. Yeah, you can see the crust at the, uh, I mean, at the Ardeola site, and you can see it. The problem with the area on Crowley's Ridge, and that is the sediments are so soft that if you make an exposure, when you get a hard rain, it, it washes it off and it kind of, kind of softens it and makes it hard to see. But you can see a. Uh, uh, sometimes a distinct break, even that, that something was going on. It's probably from that from that uh, tsunami that ripped up all these rip up class is what they're called. And there's when we dug in there one time with backhoe, we got big chunks of clay, kind of uh, orangey colored clay, light or orangey light red, uh, and, and, and then the surrounding sediment with clay, which we call rock, and it is soft rock. Clay is a soft rock, but uh, surrounding it was. Uh, Kind of gray clay, bluish gray clay that is not oxidized. These, so these chunks are pieces of clay coming from somewhere else. And I think they're rip up class that were ripped up during that uh, uh, impact. Uh, and then the uh, uh, tsunami that went up the embayment uh, ripped up chunks of material on the, on the, on the bottom of the, of the embayment and deposited them in, you know, somewhere else. And that's what we're finding. But it's uh, uh, that. Uh, the uh, Crowley's Ridge is a very interesting place too. And it's part of this whole story with the Missouri dinosaur and, uh, and, and actually even the stuff as far east as uh, Mississippi and Alabama. You get some, some effects over there of some, some pretty major tectonic events of some sort. And it might be tied in with the Missouri material. So uh, where is Crowley's Ridge? Uh, it's a ridge southwest, southwest uh, yeah. of uh, Cape Girardeau. And oh, people think it's part of the Ozarks, but it's not. It's, it's a, a, a geologically totally different. It has a culture of the Ozarks, and it's Ozark type of terrain, a lot of gravel there. They have a lot of gravel pits they mine for the for gravel roads uh, 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 through there. But, uh, and the culture is, is typically Ozark. I mean, the, the um, one thing is that uh, I find on this track that I have, it's just full of elderberries. And this one guy that lives by there, he <coughs> And he has these these <coughs> jugs of elderberry wine. And it's really good. <laughs> they, uh, they, uh, they're, uh, um, I don't know, it's, it's just, it's interesting to go down there because the culture is very different. And, and I kind of like that. It's kind of neat, a little, little icing on the cake. <laughs> I got a question yeah. about another place where a meteor hit Missouri. It's the Weeblow eggs that I collect. Mm -hmm. Oh, Wobble Creek. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That is an impact site. Yeah. There are there are three known impact sites that are definitely known and they're they're definitely recognized as being impact sites. One of them is around Steelville. It's called it's the uh, um, um, uh, Crooked Creek structure. Yeah. Yeah. And the next one is. Uh, Decatur. Yeah, Decatur, it's over around Lake of the Ozarks. It's a yeah. Decaturville structure around mm -hmm. the town of Decaturville. And then the other, third one is Wobble Creek structure, which is on the, the western edge of the Ozarks. And uh, in the creeks around there, you find those wobble eggs. They're, they're essentially chert concretions, but they're perfectly round. And uh, they look like eggs, they're not. They're chert concretions. And Missouri and Arkansas, is, uh, that's the chert capital of the world. I think we have more churn in the Ozarks than any other place I've ever been. And I've been, been lots of places geologically, you know, looking. And uh, we have lots and lots of churn here, man. It's just loaded with particularly. And um, anyway, uh, these wabu eggs are churn. And, uh, but, uh, I'm yeah. tempted to cut it in half and find something wonderful in the middle, but I'm wasting my time. Yeah, I, I think probably you know, you'll see concentric layers of churn. Yeah. Yeah, they, why, they may be tied up with that wabu creek structure. I think that because that's the only place they occur that I've ever seen them like that. I mean, there are places where church concretions are not uncommon at all, but they're usually not perfectly round. Those wild blue eggs are very perfectly round. They're very, very they're puzzling. And it's the only place that I know where they occur. So it's uh, in that wobble associated, and right in that wobble creek, they're close to ground zero on the wobble creek structure. So they're, uh, they're, uh, yeah, they're interesting, whatever they are. <laughs> and, and the other one, I'll, I guess I'll mention that because that's a possible impact site. And uh, I have a, a Schiffer book on meteorites. And uh, when I was, uh, 
I, when I was, I was a kid, I was right when I graduated from uh, high school, and uh, I went down to Rolla, well, let's see, and I met Tom Beveridge. And uh, anyway, I did the same thing I did at the Science Museum at Oakland Park. I showed what I knew about geology, which was quite a bit. I, I had read these 19th century books and I learned a lot of geology from them. And I started re reeling off all these fossil names to Tom Beveridge. And, and he was impressed. And also the stratigraphy of Missouri, which I know very well. And, and, uh, and, and he, after I was doing this for a while, he looked at me and he said, you know, he said, you, got, you have a car? And I said, no, I don't. He said, would you like to be a geologist this summer and do geology in southern Missouri? Oh, man, would I love to. You got to get a car. He said, you need a car. And so anyway, I was tickled pink with the prospect of that. And I went home to my, told my dad, and he said, well, we'll find a car. And I got a, it was a 51 Nash. It was like the Sutton Pickles. Uh, it was, uh, it was, um, uh, it was yellow. And, uh, and, and, and you could sleep in the back of it. It was nice, it was nice. And anyway, I, uh, I, I got that my dad bought it for me, and I used that to get around that summer. And, uh, and I, uh, I climbed these knobs down there in southern Missouri. What, what, what it was, that southern tier of counties across Missouri had not been mapped in detail. They had never been mapped in just little pieces. And I, you asked if I would map more little pieces, get more pieces, then you can start doing some real geology when you really map the whole county or a topographic map or something. So anyway, what, he, what I, my goal was to map as many odd areas as I could. A lot of them were knobs. That area is just full of knobs. And I'd climb up, and this was the summer, it was a hot summer. I'd climb these knobs, and I'd get into tick infestations. And they, just, they were like the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, infestations in the, the uh, rapid rat fossils from the, uh, Dr. Lunsworth Yandel. They were just they were all over the place. I'd get covered with ticks, <laughs> and uh, I'd go anyway. I did have a, 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 a thing to work from, for, you know, paid by the state. I stayed in motels so I could get showers, and that was well, that was nice. So you get a hot shower, and I'd get those ticks off of you. But uh, anyway, I found this one knob on, in um, um, Douglas County, and Douglas County had never, it still has to be mapped. But it's but I, I mapped these uh, I, I think a couple of those maps actually on, on, on YouTube I ran into it one time and Missouri Survey has one but uh, they, um, uh, they there's one couple of knobs they're like the elephant rocks they're huge boulders but they're made out of chert brescia and chert brescia is broken chert that's been resubmitted together by and, and, the, and the resubmitting has taken place because rock flour is, if you increase the surface area of some material, you increase the solubility of it. That's one way, you can grind things up if you want to dissolve something, you grind it up and you can put it in solution quicker and you can get more of it in the solution. And uh, anyway, this rock flour went into solution and submitted all these fragments of church together. Well, anyway, they were always considered to be uh, some kind of a, one is a silk creep. It's a, it's a uh, farm by weather. And, uh, but I, on my mapping, I thought that they might be of extraterrestrial origin. They might be from an, an impact site. And I have that in my chipper book. On my, I have one book on meteorites. I've gone in geology outside of this planet and have gotten into some of the geology of other parts of the, planet, of the solar system and the galaxy. And uh, one of these are these brushes. I mean, so many meteorites are precious, they're from impact. And when that impact happens, you actually produce a huge amount of rock flour. And when you produce all that rock flour, it uh, um, generates quite a bit of heat and uh, a lot of surface area. And that can, if, if there's some fluids from somewhere, and there is sometimes in meteorites, there is some water, that, that water can dissolve some of that uh, rock flour and submit all those fragments together, glue them together, and make these brushes. And that's what I think they are. Now, there's, there's some that say, no, there's still silk 
but uh, I think that they may well be from impact, and they're impact brushes formed when Missouri was hit by an asteroid sometime in the deep geologic past. I mean, they're, the, the age of the bread, the chert that, that they're made out of is Mississippian or uh, lower carboniferous, uh, which by the way, Mississippian was named later than Lyell, but lower carboniferous, lower and upper carboniferous, which is uh, the Mississippian and Pennsylvania. The upper carboniferous is the Pennsylvania period. That was named in the late 19th century from Pennsylvania. And the lower carboniferous is named from this area, named from the Mississippi Valley area, including the, 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 the subdivisions of it are named from around here, like there's the Merrimackian, named after the Merrimack River. There's the Osagian, named after the Osagian River, which is part of Lake of the Ozarks now. And there's, um, anyway, the, a lot of the Mississippi period names, because they, when, when they were calling it um, lower, lower carboniferous, it wasn't really worked out that well. It was worked out very well in the late 19th century and early in the last century. Yeah. But um, that's another aspect. Hey, but, question uh, here? Just, just yeah. General yeah. question. Uh, when I look at an open strata, the, the hillside, I see solid rock and I see weathered rock and I yeah. see the different layers. Yeah. Do you recognize these yeah. stratas oh, yeah. from one place to another? Yeah. Kind of oh, yeah. I, I even do my driving by that. <laughs> cuts and say, you know, because I know them and I know the age of them and I know where I am. It's just like a house. Uh, so you know, the good stuff is on a different level. Yeah, know. yeah, yeah. I can, I can just, I can actually drive, drive uh, in my car and spot some of them, know what formations they are. I do that on 55. I know where I am exactly. Down there. That's I, what I, I remember our trip down to Dury and you, uh, and you took uh, you took us down there, and you were just rattling off all the uh, the formations yeah, was all the way down. Yeah. 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 That was that was pretty fun. Falls is you go through a huge amount of strategic. It's really very very. The Saint John Falls system is very interesting. There's some weird stuff in there. I mentioned the uh, the um, uh, microbialites, the uh, conophyton, but there's some other things that are weird too. That are, they're just they're, they're different, and then including the possibility of diamonds. I don't know if, uh, uh, wait, he's got, where's the guy? Is he here? Uh, uh, he's he's around right. Right. Okay, well, you know, you know this holder that you have out here, he said that there's some real bright, shiny little pieces of something in there. And I wonder whether they might, I mean, he thought they might be diamonds, because that is associated with one of these kimberlites over around Womack. And uh, there's a number of kimberlites, so, and I think I think it's just a matter of time until somebody finds some diamonds here. They may be very small; they may not be worth much, but it, they could be someplace where they're bigger, and they could be. You know, there's the, that's what the area down in Arkansas is—the crater of diamonds, Murfreesboro, Arkansas. Those diamonds are really high quality. Those are that, that, that's now a state park. I mean, that was a diamond mine. I think in the twenties or maybe the turn of the century somewhere, but uh, they're. Uh, but there may be, uh, there may be, there, uh, those may be small diamonds in there. I don't know if you've ever, I haven't heard anything more about it, but I'm wondering about it. Because they are very brilliant. They were out in the sun, and, and we were looking at them, and they were just- All kinds of people were now looking at them. Yeah, yeah, so we did that rock hard. Yeah. 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 Some more questions for Mike or Bruce? I'd, I'd like to, uh, since it is your day, Appreciation Day, find out where some of these good folks are. I know you told me you were a student of Mr. Oh, Stitchcock. Uh, I'm Linda Westcott. I uh, was a student in eighth grade, 1961. Oh, at Fox High School. He taught my Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's true. Yeah. How about some of the others? We have some uh, geology clubs and so forth here with us. What, tell I'm us where a, you're from. I'm a former student of Bruce's. Are you? <laughs> I'm a former student of you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> goes around. Yeah, I'm a former student of Mike's. Former student of Mike's? How about some geology clubs or gem clubs? From uh, Los Angeles. Uh, Bruce helped me out with my dissertation research in the mid 90s. Very oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. How about in the back there? Where are you from? Fossil Club and the Mineral Club. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Sig yeah, Missouri Fossil Club. Okay, that's wonderful. We mineral clubs from Minnesota. Minnesota? <laughs> You're from Minnesota? Yeah. How'd you happen to be down here? You betcha. Warm up. Very good, very good. Yeah. All right, something that comes to mind, I was going to mention about Minnesota with, with Owen. Okay. Uh, but did you ever hear of the Cannon River, or Cannon Falls? Okay, 
there was a, a little quarry up there. One time I went and uh, anyway found these fossils that were strange looking. They look like conodermes, but they look like kind of like little fish. And these turned out to be what are called calcium chordates. And uh, they're only found in a few places in the world. And that's one of them. And um, I had a guy, oh, he's a worker. Uh, he approached me the wrong way, because I, I, I didn't really want to part with him, but I didn't want to part with one or two. He wanted them all. And he was demanding them. He was you know, being very, and I, so I, I didn't part with any of them because they're neat. But there are, there are actually the, the vertebrates I have when you get back into the Mesozoic era, there's some evidence that vertebrates came from the counter So we're related to starfish and sand dollars and, and uh, uh, crinoids and that. And uh, the, in fact, in uh, some way, the stem of the crinoid, a lot of people confuse that with fish bones. And there maybe it's not a bad analogy, because that might, there may be something to that, that there could be a relationship between our backbone and the stems of crinoids. I was wondering that when you yeah, said that. Well, that there is some, there is not real strong scientific evidence for it, but there's some. And they're called, they're known as Kelsey chordates. And that's, the best ones have been found in that quarry. In that one, in that uh, quarry at Cannon Falls. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the landowner is, uh, lives uh, very close to that. He was very nice. And uh, he was very, you know, very, very uh, friendly, very sure, go back, and, you know. And I did, and I found these, these uh, and I think I was with me on that trip too, but uh, they're they're neat, uh, they're neat looking. I had one, I had one of all my flash drives. <laughs> I left it at home, but yeah, it's can fall. But that was one of the rivers that they tried to. I guess they took a canoe a little ways up there. It's pretty small, and you could drag it on the bottom all the time, hitting bedrock and going up there very far. But I think that's one of the rivers they took all the one took canoes off all those rivers on the west side of the Mississippi to evaluate the geology. And, and then what they did, what they were using is a model, and I was going to bring that too. I forgot the Galena, but it was, a lot of it was Galena. Because over in Illinois, north, north western Illinois and north of that in, in Wisconsin, there's a mine Galena. In fact, it was known as the Tri-State Mining Air uh, in the, the, the 19th century. And uh, then they discovered um, uh, well, actually, uh, in the late 19th century, they discovered the uh, um, Galena uh, around uh, 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 Oklahoma, Pitcher, uh, Oklahoma, and southeastern Missouri. And that became known as the Tri State uh, Mining Area. And I think that name came originally from the uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, uh, Ar uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, uh, Iowa. Occurrence. But that's what they were looking for on the west side of the Mississippi was occurrence, and they did find some. And the um, I actually uh, met uh, oh, uh, let's see uh, which one was it? One of these is from the Iowa River. I had a, I had a, well no that's that's right the I a big cephalopod from the Iowa River, but that's in the same formation as Platte Formation as these these trilobites that were found on the Turkey River. North of, uh, north of, uh, of uh, Iowa, but they were looking for Galena specifically as one of the minerals to uh, retain the land from homesteading because of its use as, as for mining. And it would be a way to determine that, and it was. They did find Galena. They did mine Galena up there sometime in the early in the last century, I think. For those that are not familiar with Galena, it's sort of state mineral. Oh, yeah. It's lead sulfide, it's lead ore. Yeah. Yeah. So, real, real quick, Galena story. I happened to be in uh, northern Mexico a few years ago, back at the time that uh, National Geographic was publicizing these mines with these massive gypsum logs. Yeah. That you may have seen. So we drove to the mine to see if they let us in the sim. Uh -huh. And I think the temperature is 120 or 140 degrees or something. And yeah. they said, no, 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 we, we don't let people go in there. But they had a little. Mineral Museum on site, and I was wandering around looking, and uh, that was interesting. They had a little piece of the label of Galena from Bixby, Missouri, uh -huh. this is way down in Mexico. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, well, that's a new label. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned about one of those things. I had, I got one time in a workshop, uh, and it was around west, 
one of those about that long. It was gorgeous. And I used to bring it in these talks and somebody stole it. I have a Galena story from that Iowa, uh, Illinois thing. Yeah. We did a geo trip. One of the place nine year old geos. Yeah. There was a young man, it was the find of the day, he actually picked it up out of the spoils piles. Because it was so heavy, they figured it was solid. It uh -huh. wasn't a geo. Oh, yeah. It was a geo. You cracked it open, there was a big Galena twist. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a nice one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, those things are from here. Yeah, that's what they were after. Galena and uh, coal, they were after coal beds. And as you can see, you know, the, the you can see that the uh, steam engine was going to be a thing in the future, and they needed coal for that. But uh, and they, uh, the coal beds, they would watch for um, some of the Pennsylvania rocks, or, or uh, upper carboniferous rocks, uh, will have carbon like that. But that's an obvious plant. That's, that's obviously, but that's, that's a coal age plant. And uh, they would have, um, uh, sometimes you commonly find this, in the shales of the Pennsylvania air, 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 you find fragments of branches and pieces of wood. And that's indicative that you might have a coal seam somewhere in that area. And that's what they were doing. They were doing that reconnaissance geology for the, uh, to find out what minerals might be there to preserve those areas for, for uh, from the Is that from their shell mine? Yeah, that's from the shell mine. Uh, yeah, it's Northwest Reserve. Yeah. Yeah. And this is an interesting discipleship on this that I'll just mention because it does bring into it one of the things that I have. Um, this is a seed impression. Can you see it there? Okay, now this is, this is about 200, about three, almost 300 million years old. There were no seeds, plants back there. Seed, seed, seeds are known as angiosperms, and they appeared in abundance at the end of the Mesozoic year. They pop in, they're, they're one of the fossils that appears suddenly, like, like these here, over here, uh, are Eocene. And there's gobs of there's cinnamon, and this is a palm, that's a fig, um, that's a cinnamon, this is... Um, cinnamon. Cinnamon, yeah, yeah. Well, this is, this is uh, 40 million years ago. 40 million years ago was a lot warmer than it is today. And these essentially are plants you now found in the, found in the Caribbean. But used to, you find those as fossils in Tennessee and Kentucky, or mostly Tennessee, <coughs> Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, in that Gulf Coastal area that, that uh, Lyle Travers going down the uh, Alabama River. And uh, anyway, this here is, uh, this is much older, this is Pennsylvania. And uh, this uh, Pennsylvania is uh, it's around 300 million years, 290 million years old. But it's a seed. And wait now, it's not supposed to be seeds that far back. Well, actually, that's not right. There's no, there's no angiosperm. No, there's no angiosperm. But there were seeds. But there were seeds, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Seeds. You're right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is a seed. But it's not an angiosperm. Right. Well, what is it? Now, there was a collector um, by the name of John Britz. And he was another like um, uh, 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 Lunsworth. In, in Kentucky, uh, in Louisville. Uh, uh, Brits was a physician. And physicians used to get, I guess they still do get a lot of biology. So you can get into stuff that very much touches on paleontology. And you remember Frank Winter, how he was, he was very, he was, very, uh, he, he taught physiology for the dental school more than St. Few, or no, Washington. But uh, anyway, um, this John Brits um, lived in, uh, uh, well, Henry County in uh, Clinton, Missouri, in the ni late 19th century. And they discovered in the 19th century these, they're called paleocars. They're sinkholes that farmed in the limestones in the uh, lower uh, Carboniferous Mississippi and age limestones. And then they would sink, as the limestones would dissolve, and they would form depressions, which would become areas for, for plants and uh, swamps, essentially, coal age swamps. And they would become, the plants would become a coal seam. And they found that those were all through Henry County, those, those sinkholes, or they're called paleocarsts. And Missouri's characteristic by a large number of karst phenomena. In fact, 
the Chronister side has been interpreted as possibly partially cost there, as you probably know. But uh, anyway, they, um, uh, uh, he, uh, when they started mining in those in the very late 19th century, about the, about the uh, uh, same time when the phonograph became a consumer product, <laughs> and for, for, the, for the average popular per person, uh, about that time, 18, 1895 or 96, somewhere in there, uh, they, uh, 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 he, they found out that the shale overlying that coal was full of fantastic fossils, absolutely beautiful ones, and big fronds, I mean, big, big fern fronds, and, and uh, at that time, they were thought to be ferns. And ferns don't reproduce by seeds, ferns reproduce by spores. And uh, their uh, uh, ferns are pteridophytes. Pteridophytes do not produce seeds. Well, what are all these? Anyway, in these shales overlying these coal seams, there were these fronds, some of which had at the end a seed on them. And that was strange. Those, those weren't ferns, not with a seed. And uh, he collected those. He realized that they were scientifically valuable. He collected them, and then he distributed them to all of the colleges in the Midwest, and which included Rolla. Rolla has a bunch of them in their collection. I hope they still re I hope they realize the value of those. Uh, Washington U has has some. You have seen those in Washington U's out there. Um, I guess Carbondale, I think, has some. The, almost all the colleges that were around in the turn of the 19th century have specimens that were sent by John Briss to, to, to share them. And a lot of colleges have, some of them anyway, in the area, I've heard there's a couple in Iowa that they have disposed of. I heard, I saw it at maps, a, a guy with a bunch of them, and he got them from the dumpster guy. They were in a geology department that threw them in a dumpster. Now this is, I think this is tantamount to treason. <laughs> And, and, it, and it, it, it gets, see, I will mention another thing here with this, I don't know how this thing with the sand quarry uh, on Highway 32, but if that gets going, there is a fossil in the Lamont sandstone that's rare, but it's in there. It's called the Cambrian motorcycle track. Yeah. It looks exactly like a motorcycle. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's 530 million years old, it's Cambrian. And uh, now if they run into some of those, they should save them and give them to the museum here. Because those are unique. And uh, they do have, they have one down in Rolla from Highway High, High 72. It's a gorgeous, beautiful specimen. And uh, was found in the cut after the cut was made. But they may have, when they cut that, they may have uh, got into a bunch of them. I have a related one from I-55 out here, right? Oh, um, north of uh, the uh, Highway 32 that I found when they were built, when they were digging that cut. I went through a lot of that rock when they were cutting through there. But it's getting harder to do that. And, and the quarries have become to where there's some decision now that it's a federal decision with the Bureau of Mines that you're not supposed to let anybody into a working quarry at all, and, and uh, no matter what. And that's, that's extreme. Because I mean, you know, if you if you take some precautions and, and sign a release, I think releases should be worth the paper they're printed on. They're not, and uh, that's wrong. I think that's totally wrong. I think that's, that's too much lawyer. But that's that's just, that's we're getting into another subject. Now, was that was that were those but, uh, motorcycle anyway. tracks? Were those ichno fossils? What were those ichno fossils? Yeah, they're ichno fossils. They're trace fossils. Yes. I, yeah, it's probably some kind of a mollusk. Uh, a friend of mine, well, he's passed away. Ellis Jolson and a friend of mine, Mike Stu, we were talking about this coming down. They think that those things may be some kind of a mollusk, some kind of a giant nematode, uh, giant ones, you know, big ones about the size of a small dog or a medium-sized dog. And uh, it's slug like so, mm -hmm. soft, yeah, soft bodied uh, organisms with no hard part of the story. Yes. So they're very rarely preserved, except mm -hmm. with the tracks, ways, or sometimes you get, usually in shales, you'll get carbonaceous impressions where the organism will be compressed as a film of carbon. That's the Burgess shale fossils are that way. And, uh, but this kind of stuff is valuable. This is the kind of stuff that's scientifically valuable. And it used to be that quarries would work with geologists and that, and, and they, I noticed starting about maybe 30, 40 years ago, that stopped. 
Yeah, you don't find that anymore. And uh, the, uh, I, that's, uh, that's, I think it's terrible. And uh, I think it's, uh, I think disposing of anything that has scientific or historical value is is a terrible thing to do. Just dump it in a dumpster, you know. We all agree with that. Well, you know, <laughs> it's a shame you don't aren't much of a storyteller. <laughs> all these people come and you just have nothing to say. <laughs> We are so appreciative of you being associated with this museum and also with the Missouri Ozark Dinosaur Project. And you deserve an appreciation day. Yeah. Okay. Oh, what happened? 